TC Nation, what's up? No, you can do better than that. TC Nation, what's up? Do me a favor, if you're excited to be alive, just type a fire sign in the comment right there. If you're excited to be alive, I want you to type a fire sign in the comment. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come on, church. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I I've been waiting a long time to say this. I'm at transformation, man. No, I'm going to say it again. I'm at transformation. Do, do me a favor. I, I need some water behind. I, no, I want everything Pastor Mike has. I need bushes. I need three lions. I need Jesus. I need a storm. Is this not, I'm going to say this, and if you agree, show me some love. The best church in the world, man. I mean this. So I want to say shout out to my brother, Pastor Mike, my sister, Natalie, the entire family, that beautiful baby girl. Oh, my Lord. I almost said I wanted one, but I have five. God bless you. I am done. To my beautiful wife who's watching right now, I love you, baby girl. To Xander, Michael, Mason, McKinley, and Miles. See, when you got a lot of kids, you have to say it real slow. I love you guys so much. The Rock City Church. I know many of you aren't even watching our service today. You are rocking with us at Transformation, and I am so excited about it. Do me a favor, TC Nation, let's shut the, the, the web down. Put your city in the comment right now, right there. Let's go. Put your city. Where are you watching from? No, hear me. Where? I don't think. I'm. Where are you watching from right now? Dallas, Detroit, Birmingham, Atlanta, London. Put your city in the comment. Let's shut it down. I am excited about what God is doing. Or should I say it's time to represent. And I am excited about what God is doing in your life. I am excited. So do me a favor. I want to I wanna pray. Just repeat after me. Say, Lord, Lord your, will, your will, nothing more, nothing, more, nothing, less, nothing less, nothing else. Nothing else. In Jesus' name, in Jesus. amen. amen. Well, my name is Pastor Mike Jr. I pastor in Birmingham, Alabama, Rock City Church. This has been an incredible month for me. I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I was blessed to take home three Gospel Stella Awards this month. One being Artist of the Year. I mean this. My son Mason is starting on his football team, which is so incredible. I am excited about that, and now I am at the most powerful place on the planet where transformation is taking place and progress is everything. So I'm so excited about what God is doing. So take your seats in the room, and if you're watching at home, I want you to prepare your heart because I necessarily don't want to preach a sermon. I just want to have a conversation that points you to Jesus but honors your man of God. Is that critical? Because so many times when you're busy lifting up Jesus, who lifts up the lifter? Did you catch what I just said? And, and I want to talk about that. Why, Pastor Mike? Because I want you to understand one of the most common misconceptions about Pastor Mike Todd is that he's just popular. One of the most mis common misconceptions, most common misconceptions about Mike Todd is that he's just popular. When in actuality, he's popular, but he's also, also influential. So I'm already talking. Do me a favor. Take really good notes because there's a difference between influence and popularity. There's a difference between influence and popularity. See, when you're aiming to be popular, it is more about what you want from people. Aiming to be influential is about what you want for people. Did you catch what I just said? Aiming to be popular is about what you want from people, while aiming to be influential is about what you want for people. See, when you're popular, people know you. When you're influential, people believe you. And I want to submit that all of our lives are forever better, not because of his popularity, but because of his influence. Somebody just type influence. What, what if I told you early in this little Easter speech of mine that your family would treat you better if they realized it was the influence on your life that was going to get them to another level? And what I am suggesting as we prepare for a fun month, as we prepare and celebrate a fun month, please don't allow the fun to make you think we're foolish. Because there's a thin line between being fun and being 
foolish. Fun is intentional. Foolishness is ignorance. And so many people think they're having fun, but they're really being foolish. See, you're having fun when you understand who you are and whose you are. And why are we so excited about what God is doing here at Transformation Church and through the life of pastors Mike and Natalie Todd? It's because they are helping people rediscover who they are in Christ. Rediscover who they are in Christ. That's so important. Why PMJ? Because if you live long enough, you're going to encounter two types of people. Are you taking notes? Live long enough, you're going to encounter two types of people. Please put this in your notes. Paul bearers and armor bearers. Pallbearers and armor bearers. Now, most of us have been to a funeral. A pallbearer is that with person who carries you to your grave, while an armor bearer is the person who carries you to your destiny. That, that, there's a difference. There's a difference. That a pallbearer will carry you to your grave, while an armor bearer carries you to your destiny. And I would like to challenge all of us in TC Nation that we should level up in our support, level up in our intercession, because it is our responsibility to be armor bearers, not pallbearers. But sadly, so many people will never become what God has predestined and ordained them to be because they do not like pain. That's critical. They do not like pain or adversity. Someone type. Someone say adversity. Adversity is the price that we pay for advancement. Adversity is the price that we pay for advancement. Make that make sense, Pastor Mike. If you want to go far, you have to pay a price called pain. And sadly, so many of us finish uh, short of what God desires for us to be because we run from the thing that's actually developing us. Now, now, this may be a tweetable moment. This may be a tweetable or IG moment right here. God won't take you out the storm, but he won't let the storm take you out. I don't think you heard what I said. God won't take you out the storm, but he also won't allow the storm to take you out. Why, Pastor Mike? My name's Pastor Mike. I'm at Pastor Mike's church. So when I say Pastor Mike, if you listen closely, it almost feels like Pastor Mike is preaching, but he's actually not preaching. But I'm preaching, but I'm Pastor Mike. And if Pastor Mike was here, he would look at you and say, look at me when I say this. It, it, it is the pain of being you that creates the power of being you. Do I need to say that again? It is the pain of being you that created the power of being you. See, I only want you to praise God at home or in this room if you've been through some stuff, survived some stuff, but you can say this morning, here it is, I'm still alive. I wish I had a thousand people who would just type, I'm still alive. That after everything that I've been through, in spite of the drama of my past and the pain of my mistakes, I'm still alive. When that nefarious nemesis known as the devil tries with all of his might to thwart our thinking and attenuate our faith, we've assembled that transformation to say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him somebody shout I'm still alive that that's for the people in the room and the people in the chat who if you had to summarize the last three years of your life you can have an old school testimony service all by yourself and simply say I'm still alive Come here, come, come here. Now, now, most of y'all are young and fly, so you don't know about old school church. I'm from Alabama. I'm from Birmingham. We had old school church, right? So you would get to church, and you would sit in the back, and it wasn't praise and worship. There would be a deacon who would line up across the front. They didn't have harmonies. They didn't have a musician. They would sing songs like, let the church say yes. Yes, and grandmama would start rocking. Then all of a sudden, the pastor would come up. He wasn't fly like your pastor. He would have on a full robe, and he would stand there and say, well, it's testimony time. And somebody in the room who wasn't on the program would just raise their hand and walk to the front. Then they would say, now, if you're really churchy, I want you to finish this statement in the comments. First, giving honor to God. So y'all, churchy is all get out. First, giving honor to Who's the head of my life to the pastor, saints, and friends? It is good for us that God is good and all the time. 
and they would do something in this service that would flip the whole church. She would get up and say, well, y'all know I only had $7 in the bank today, and the doctor said I needed my medicine, and I didn't know how I was going to get my medicine, but I went down to the drugstore, and it was a man at the drugstore who paid for my medicine. Then she would say, and I just want to thank you. And even though it had nothing to do with the people over here, they were so excited to see God do something for her that they praised God like he did it for him. See, you are a hater if you can only praise God for the stuff you got. But I'm crazy enough to praise God for everybody connected to me. Why? Because when God blesses you, here it is, if he blesses my neighbor, that means he's in my neighborhood. Somebody shout, God's in the blessing business. But until you go through something, you do not properly understand what God desires to do in your life. Somebody say adversity. Adversity is the price you pay for advancement. And it's the pain of being you that creates the power of being you. In other words, it's your testimony. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, we are free. By the blood of the lamb and by the words of a testimony. And I want you to understand that there are two types of adversity you will face in your life. Are you watching? Are y'all watching? Y'all rocking with me? Two types of adversity you will face in your life. It is external adversity and internal adversity. Oh, if I was at my church, I would have yelled, Michael. And external adversity and internal adversity. See, external adversity is me versus my enemies. Internal adversity is me versus me. Jesus. External is me versus them. See, this is my problem with so many people because if all your battles are about your haters, you are not advancing because true growth isn't when you kill Goliath. True growth is when you deal with the demons that are on the inside of you. I don't know who's going to be honest, but I wish I had seven people in the chat who will say, Pastor Mike, you are preaching to me because my worst enemy is the enemy in a me. Did you catch that? My worst enemy is the enemy in a me. There was a man. Am I doing all right? There was a man who was among the tombs. And the Bible says every night he would scream and he would holler and he was in the tombs cutting himself. Nobody cut him. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't. No, nobody cut him. Hear me now. It's one thing if the enemy was cutting him up. It's one thing if his haters were throwing stones at him. But this man was cutting himself. And I want to speak to some people who are watching me right now who are mature enough to say that there were certain seasons of my life where I cut myself. Stop blaming your ex for all the pain you went through five years ago. You picked them. I cut myself. Stop blaming everybody for the reason you don't have the finances you should have had. You were buying stuff you probably shouldn't have bought. You cut yourself. See, anybody can talk about who hated on them, but I'm mature enough to understand there were seasons when I cut myself. Somebody say, preach, Michael. Because if you're going to be great, you're going to be great. We can use uh, Pastor Mike's Todd life as a euphemism or a metaphor to a formula called greatness. Because when we look at Paul, he is analogous uh, to somewhat of Pastor Mike Todd because both of them go through purpose and pain. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they go through purpose and pain. And when it comes to purpose and pain, the two aren't mutually exclusive. You can't have one without the other. It was purpose that made David rush to the front line to fight Goliath. But it was painful when his brothers and his father didn't think he was good enough to be king. It was purpose that made Joseph dream and find favor on another level. But it was painful watching your father and your brothers, your brothers rather, sell you into slavery. It was purpose that made that perfect Palestinian Jew named Jesus look into a cup. It was purpose... It was purpose that made that perfect Palestinian Jew named Jesus look into a cup and suggest, nevertheless, thy will be done. But it was painful enduring the crucifixion. Might I submit to someone watching us today that if pain was his death certificate, purpose became his birth certificate. 
that sadly many of us need to thank God for our church and our leaders because so many churches are developing a generation on celebration, not suffering. We are conditioning a new generation of Christians on celebration, not suffering. We are teaching them how to praise, but we are not teaching them how to pray. We are teaching them to have energy, but we are not teaching them to endure. When the truth of the matter is, there are going to be seasons of your life where you have to survive some of the craziest seasons of your life. It is called purpose, and it's called pain. And when we tiptoe into the corridors of today's text, we find ourselves situated and acculturated in the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, we are introduced to Paul. I love it how my professors put it. They said, Paul, that talented tent maker from Tarsus who constantly tentilates us with tough theology. It is Paul who constantly tentilates us with tough theology. Paul is so cold-blooded. And I know what you're looking at me like. I see you. This is Tulsa. So this is from across the country. Pastor Mike, who is Paul to tell me anything? I grew up in the hood, and I know firsthand that before you tell me anything, I need to hear your resume. I often say, don't give me constructive criticism if you haven't constructed something. Because ain't it crazy how people try to tell you how to build yours when they've never built theirs? Michael! Paul said, Mike, since you had transformation and they keep it real, tell them I've been through some stuff. I survived some stuff and I live to tell the tale. Please tell them at transformation. I've been beaten so many times and I can remember. Left for dead. One time I got off a boat and I hooked up with my brother Silas and we were on our way to pray, but then we bumped into a sister by the name of Lydia and the Bible says Lydia was an entrepreneur. She was a seller of purple. What does that mean, Pastor Mike? She bumps into Paul and Silas. Paul saves her, but the Bible doesn't stop there. And this is enough to just have church all in your living room. The Bible says when Lydia heard a word, here it is, her family got baptized. I think I'm in the wrong church this morning. I don't think you caught that. When Lydia got a word, the whole family got delivered. See, I am not preaching to everybody, only the somebody who's listening this morning who's crazy enough, crazy faith, crazy enough, crazy faith, crazy enough to believe that if I get a word from God, everybody in my family is going to be blessed. Now, I'm about to ask you to do something real crazy right here, but only do it if you got crazy faith. What would happen if you tagged every member of your family and said, whatever you're doing, stop what you're doing? Because there's a word on Transformation Church this morning that will shift our whole family. I need five people to just say, God, I thank you for the word that my mother is getting delivered, my father is being delivered, my cousins are being delivered, my family is being set free, healed, and delivered because I got a word. He bumps into Lydia. Can't you see Paul? Paul is just doing his thing, right? He's walking. Then out of nowhere, boom, he bumps into Lydia. He sets Lydia free. Whole family gets blessed, and he's continued to walking. Then all of a sudden, he sees a girl. And the Bible says this girl had a spirit of divination. Uh, she should have she should have been a prophetess, but because she was in the wrong hands, they turned her into a fortune teller. Y'all, woo, you missed what I said. She should have been a prophetess, but because she was in the wrong hands, they took her gift and twisted it. Might I submit to you that sometimes the problem isn't you. It might be whose hands you're in. Michael. So, so answer, answer, answer this question for me. If I buy basketball from Walmart, how much is that ball worth? About $15 in my hands. But if I put, put it in LeBron James' hands, yeah. it's worth $25 million. How, how much is a pair of golf clubs in my hands? I can't play a lick, probably $50. But, but if I put it in Tiger Woods' hands, it's worth about $50 million. How, how much are groceries in my hands? I can't cook. I burn the whole kitchen up. But if you put it in Big Mama's hands or Grandmama's hands, she can feed the whole family. See, the problem isn't the basketball the golf club or the groceries. The problem is who's... I wish I had seven people who would just put hands up in the comments. 
I, I hope you don't take out running. What if your ex wasn't wrong about what he said? What, what if your ex was wrong about what they said when they said, you'll never be nothing? No, I'll never be nothing in your hands. That, that, that's why they want you back. That, that's why go ahead and delete your inbox because the reason they want you back is because when you left, they thought you were going to fall off, but they didn't realize the favor stayed with you. Somebody type, I'm in the right hands. This is why, this is why, this is why your job irritates you because you're too gifted to be in their hands. That this is why being a part of this ministry has revolution, revolutionized your life. That people at your last church literally said there was nothing for you to do, but now you're promoting in the prophetic and you're helping in different ministries and you're growing like crazy. Why? I'm in the right hands. Yeah. Somebody ought to just type, I'm in the right hands. That, that this sister, that this young girl, hear me now, Paul, Paul is walking and he bumps into this young girl and she's following behind him saying, these are men of the most high God. These are men of the most high God. These are men of the most high God. The problem isn't what she's saying. She's saying the right thing. She's saying it with the wrong spirit. Be careful because every compliment ain't pure. Jesus, hear me when I say this. And Paul looks at her and says, in the name of Jesus, come out. Now, now here's the problem that I see Paul having, but I also see Pastor Mike having. Because the people who were benefiting from her brokenness got upset. Because there are certain people who profit off your pain, benefit from your brokenness, live off of the areas in your life that are less than status quo. When they saw she got delivered, they beat Paul. Now, now this is cold-blooded. This, this is cold-blooded. This is cold-blooded. Because I wonder how many people in your life like you better broken. Michael. I wonder how many people in your life like you limp. You, you know, they, they like you limp. Because if you ever get whole, you'll move too fast. So, so they like you with a limp. Because when you walk with a limp they don't have to be who they are they can just keep up with you see there are certain people who like you better broken see this is why they will go out with you but won't come to church with you this is why they will spill the tea but since that transformation we understand our prayer is the sauce they want the tea not the sauce because they don't understand I want to have fun only but we don't just have fun the reason we have fun at transformation is because we've already been fueled by God did you catch what I just said right there Paul is now caught between a rock and a hard spot so much like Pastor Mike because the problem that Pastor Mike faces sometimes is not that he's saving people he's saving the right wrong people See, see, the world didn't matter, didn't care when people were transferring churches. They can't stand when people come out the world. And, and what's happening now, because they were benefiting from her brokenness, the Bible says they beat Paul and Silas. And I, and I love the way they did it. And if I had to succinctly summarize what happened to Paul and Silas, they were beaten, bruised, broken, bloodied, but breathing. They were beaten, bruised, broken, bloody, hmm, but breathing. If, if I was at my grandmama church right there, three old ladies would have took out screaming right there because they know what it's like to be beaten, bruised, broken, bloodied, but breathing. And the text says they were stripped. Now, most people speed past this little nuance called stripped, but they don't understand the historical implications of being stripped. The historical implications of being stripped is this. During historical times, they believed in classes and ranks. Because they believed in classes and ranks, people who were of noble respect wore clothes or a linen ephod or a nice silk robe. Remember I told you earlier, Lydia was a seller of purple. She sold material for those who could afford it. But slaves and commoners just covered their private areas. So the first thing they do before they beat them is strip them. Because they were trying to send a psychological message to Paul that maybe if I take your stuff, I will take you. And see, everybody's not going to say amen right here. Only the people who've been stripped but survived. 
I was stripped of my confidence when I dated this person. They told me everything I was not. And for the last three years, I've been trying to find myself. And I thank God for my church because everything that was stripped, God restored. I was stripped in a season when I had to live paycheck to paycheck. And I think, didn't think I was worthy to be who God called me to be. But God restored such a one. See, anybody can shout because you've been saved. And my problem with the 21st century Christian is that you celebrate your recovery, but you speed past your process. Yeah, we're, 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 it's, it's, it's almost like Easter. We're quick to celebrate the eschatological impact, eschatology end times. We're quick to celebrate the eschatological impact that we breeze past the existential reality. What is that, PMJ? We're so ready to say he got up that we speed past the fact that he went down. And so many people feel um, um, unworthy because when you get around Christians and church people, they're so busy to tell you about their come up. That they, they always ignore they're going down. Yeah. And see, I wish I had somebody in the comments who would be honest enough to say, I've been down. Yeah. Woo, see, it got real quiet right there. Yeah. If you was here, you would see how quiet it got. Because we live in a culture where we sing songs like, all I do is win, 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 no matter what. And we want to talk about the celebration. I got a really big team and I got some really big rings. And I had enough sense to write a song in Kaido Big. So now everybody's saying, Pastor Mike, it's going to be... Big, but what happens when it's small? Weeping may endure for a night. Watch this. But here's what we shout. But joy is coming in the morning. When in reality, if we don't condition people for the night, they will never make it to the morning. And I don't need a church full of people who are going to say, I survived. I need some people in the comments to say, I know what it's like to be down. I wish I had somebody who would say, Pastor, look at me. I know what it's like to survive a divorce. I know what it's like to have no money in the bank and have to trust God. I know what it's like to be in between jobs. I know what it's like to be pregnant with vision, but it's aborted by lack. I, I know. Do I need to say that again? I know what it's like to be pregnant with vision, but it's aborted by lack. That, that I have a million dollar dream on a hundred dollar budget. I know what it's like to ride by builders and be like, oh, that can be my spot right there. But don't have the resources to make it happen. And God says, if you be faithful over little stuff, I'll make you ruler over many. And Paul, Paul is beaten, bruised, broken, bloody, but breathing. And so many times we glamorize the gospel. We, we make it cute. This is not a cute situation. He's beat. And can't see Paul. And he's trying to check on Silas. Silas, you good? Because uh, he's been beat. Uh, and it's crazy because he can probably barely breathe. His sores are open. There are no ace bandages invented yet. There, there's no ointment. There's no medication. There's nothing. And Paul... And he, uh, and they throw him in the inner jail. And Paul's tripping because I didn't get beat for living wrong. I got beat for doing right. See, because one of the common misconceptions about being saved is that you only catch hell when you're wrong. But I come to submit to some of you that sometimes you catch hell for doing right. And the Bible says they throw Paul and Silas in jail and here's the scripture that should tear the whole web up it should tear the whole online campus up TC Nation you should go berserk I should get 20 million fire signs in the comment when I say this because there are certain scriptures that you have to properly build a bridge of contemporization from the original audience to now properly harmonizing your hermeneutics with relevant homiletics making sure you have syntax and context you got to make sure you get the historicity of the text and make sure they see it in a very real way but then there are certain scriptures that when you you read it some in you ought to go crazy and this scripture says and at midnight now I'm somewhat flummoxed or confused about what midnight is it's midnight today or tomorrow I I I'm confused because I know 1159 is today and I know 1201 is tomorrow but what is midnight I I I'm, 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 I'm confused because 1159 is today then 1201 is tomorrow but 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 what is Midnight. It's midnight the first of tomorrow or the last of yesterday. 
And, and I believe if I had to succinctly summarize or McClurize what midnight is, if, if 11.59 is today and 12.01 is tomorrow, 12 o'clock midnight is transition. Yeah. And many of you are catching hell right now and frustrated because you're not who you used to be. And you're not who you're going to be. But you're stuck in transition. See, th th this is what, I wish I had a hundred people who would just type, I'm in transition. I'm in the wrong church. Rod, I'm in transition. Say it again, Mike. I'm not who I used to be. Then I'm not who I'm going to be. I'm still in transition. But here's the beautiful thing. And at, and at Transformation Church, one of our hot words at Transformation Church is progress. And I never forget in studying, I discovered something called progressive sanctification. It's called progressive mm, sanctification. This means I am in process. It means, mama, oh Lord, I'm scared to say this in front of mama because she may come pop me on the hand when I say this. Captain may run up here and say, boy, keep your mouth closed. But what if I told you the reason some churches are dying because you got people who think they have arrived. But the reason transformation is growing by leaps and bounds is because you've accepted people who are in process. See, see, I don't want the perfect people. All my perfect folk, you can sit this out. But everybody who's in transition, say, preach, Pastor Mike. Preach, Pastor Mike. Preach, Pastor Mike. How do I know I'm in transition? Because I'm saved, but I might hit you if you cross me the wrong way. How do you know I'm in transition? Because I can speak in tongues and might slip up and cuss if you mess with my kids. Pray for me. Grandmama said, please be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. I am in transition. It was Michael Eric Dyson who said many of us are stuck in anesthetizing conformity. It was Michael Eric Dyson who said many of us are stuck in anesthetizing conformity. Anesthesia, it puts you to sleep. Anesthetizing, anesthesia, it puts you to sleep. You're so busy trying to fit in, you forgot God called you to break out. So, so the culture or the climate that you find yourself in has become anesthetizing. It's put you to sleep. So now you walk like everybody else, talk like everybody else, pray like everybody else, want what everybody else got. And the problem with many of you watching me is that you fell in love with your am, but you forgot your be. All right. You, you fell in love with your am, but you forgot your be. See, I am blessed, but I used to be broke. Yeah. I, I, I am saved, but I used to be a hot mess. I am in church on Sunday morning, but five years ago, I would have been in the bed because I was out all night the night before, and I'm not who I need to be, but I'm a whole lot better than where I come from. Paul is locked away in jail, and the text says, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sing praises unto God, so much so that the prisoners heard them, and immediately their bands were loose. Wrong. My problem with my generation is that that we preach uh, an inaccurate gospel, we preach an incomplete gospel. My problem with the 21st century church is not that we preach an inaccurate gospel, we preach an incomplete gospel. Make that make sense, Pastor Mike. We say, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sing praises unto God, so much so that immediately the doors were open and the bands were loose. That is incomplete. Because the text says, while they were praising, the text says God caused an earthquake. See, you can't leave that out because if you leave that out, it makes the text incomplete because if you tell church members that when they prayed and praised, the door opened, it makes them leave church believing that the power to open the door is in their mouth. No, the power to open the door is not in your mouth. It's in your ability to submit to the timing of God because if you shout before the earthquake, all you're doing is making a noise. But if you shout when God moves, doors open. Michael, and what I'm trying to get you to realize is praise without pain is just a performance. Praise without pain is just a performance, which is why there are certain signs when you scream to the top of your lungs and don't feel nothing because you were praying without the move. The text says God caused an earthquake. Paul started shouting, and then immediately the doors opened. I got to go. I'm running out of time. But the text says only Paul and Silas shouted, but everybody got an open door. 
Ooh, I feel like having a little church by myself. I, I wish my amen corner caught that because it didn't say everybody shouted. The scripture says two people had crazy faith. Two people had crazy faith. Two people had enough faith to shout behind bars. But because two folk praised God, everybody got an open door. See, I only want seven people with crazy faith to praise God from your home, praise God from your job, praise God from your car. And I want to speak by faith that when you shout, everybody around you is getting an open door. I'm giving you, come here, I am giving you 20 seconds to praise God that he's opening a door for everybody connected to you. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered the hearts of men. What God is about to do for you, somebody shout. I got to go right, right, right. Right, right. That's too, that's too cute for me. Right, I, I need some movie music. I need something like. Drama, help me out. And can't you see Paul and Silas? They're shouting. And when they shout, one door, two doors three door we all get a door I said one door two door three door we all got a door say one door two door three door we all got a door yeah woke up this morning I'm blessed blessed I, I'm, I'm sorry I, snapped. I almost snapped but 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 hear me hear, hear me so can't you see because because the, the Bible doesn't tell me the Bible doesn't tell me and the text says my, my professor taught me when the Bible is silent you should be quiet too I don't know if all the doors open together or the door open one by one so for the sake of the story let's just act like we see what happened one door oh can't you imagine Paul door boom his neighbor door, boom. The third door, boom. The fourth door, boom. Now, for the sake of the argument, if I was in cell nine, I would have started the night like, y'all be quiet. Ain't nobody coming. Ain't nobody. Ain't no, yeah, yeah. Because you are only a real friend when you can shout because you realize the blessing is on the way. Somebody type, it's on the way. Watch this, 16 minutes, 16 minutes, all right? But here's the beautiful part. And I told you, I told you that my problem isn't that we preach an inaccurate gospel. We preach an incomplete gospel. Because I was trained when I preach, I go home right there. Look at your neighbor and say, doors are opening. And I wish I had somebody who can tell your neighbor, doors are getting ready to open. But, but that, is, that, that, that is incomplete. Because the text says the door is open and the guard comes running in. And the, dark come, the guard comes and says, oh my God, the door is open. And he pulls out a knife getting ready to kill himself. And Paul says, hey. Chill out. We still here. Now, I'm from the hood, so you got to pray for me. I, I wish I could say it properly. I, will, I got, well, this is a church for everybody, so I'm going to try to say it in everybody's language. Here it is. Guard, sir, don't bother killing yourself. All of us who are in currently incarcerated are still present and accounted for. But then I believe somebody in the hood like, yo, bruh, bruh. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. We still here. We still here. That's enough for seven people in the comments to just type, we still here. Yeah, COVID tried to take us out, but we're still here. Rumors and demise tried to take us down, but we're still here. Look at me, here's what I love. Paul says we're still here. God, can I ask you a question? Yes, Michael. God, can I ask you a question? Yes, Michael. Stop hating David. Are you always trying to talk to him? Stop, Holy Spirit. Let me get one question in. Go ahead. Yes, God, thank you. Um, why open the door if they ain't gonna leave? And God says, Mike, I opened the door not to let them out, but to prove they couldn't be kept in. Because every door that opened ain't meant for you to walk out of. Sometimes God opens the door to prove to your enemies if you wanted to. 
Only seven people gonna catch this. Don't think because I can't. Don't think because I don't, I can't. If I wanted to, boo, boo, I could do it. And it's this Paul who we find in Acts chapter 27. All of that was my introduction. Seven minutes, I'm gonna be done. It's that Paul who we find shipwreck on a boat. He turns to the captain and says in Acts chapter 27, I don't think it's wise for us to sail at this time. The captain looks at him and says, shut up, Paul. I'm paraphrasing. Paul said, if you knew like I knew we wouldn't sail, something's going to happen. The, the captain says, boy, I got this. Paul says, trust me, I prayed about it. We shouldn't sail. The captain says, no, I got experience. And this is for seven people who understand I may not have the experience, but I do have the discernment. See, people try to hold their degrees over your head, and I believe in education, but life will take you to a place where your bachelors can't figure it out. You need the Holy Spirit and discernment. It was discernment that made him write down a prayer to believe God for this building, not experience. It was discernment to have him take a leap of faith and write crazy faith. It was discernment that made a pastor of another ethnicity hand a ministry to a young black kid and say, I'm going to follow you and I believe in you. That was discernment. And God will show you what books came. And Paul gets on the boat, right? And, and they get halfway and a storm breaks loose. If I had time, I would tell you that one of the greatest tricks of the enemy is the fact that he calms things down long enough to make you think it's God. See, see, the devil tricks you into getting so far out there that you too far to turn around, but not even close to where you're going. Then, boom, he lets a storm break loose. And everybody on the boat is, oh, boat is panicking. Everybody is panicking. Man down, 747, ship down. Somebody get off the boat. And they're going crazy, right? Then all of a sudden, Paul gets a word from an angel, and the angel sneaks on the boat and tells Paul, stop tripping. You got to stand trial before Rome. And Paul looked at the boat, and I'm paraphrasing that for the sake of time. He says, Captain, y'all stop tripping. We're going to make it. And the moment Paul says we're going to make it, the Bible says the boat begins to break. Now, I want to pause here with my last 11 minutes and break something down because I'm a pastor, but I've also been a pastor's son. I've sat in church and I spoke in church. So there were certain days when my father preached a word that I received, but when I left the church, what I received was antithetical to what I saw. He told me it was the biggest year of my life, then I call hell. Paul says, and I hope you catch this, Paul says, Paul says, we're going to make it, but then, but then the boat breaks. So did Paul lie? No. I believe if Paul was here, he would say, Pastor Mike, PMJ, I never said the boat was going to make it. I said, we're going to make it. Which means you may lose some stuff, but you won't lose you. <laughs> And Paul, the Bible says, I'm in Acts chapter 27, 276 people jump off the boat and are in the water. So, so can't you imagine 276 people in the boat? They jump in the water and the Bible says, Mike, don't shout. The Bible says, Michael, don't shout. The Bible says, Michael, get it together. You're in Transformation Church. Do not embarrass yourself, okay? The, the Bible says that 276 people made it to shore, watch this, off of pieces of the boat. I only want you to shout and I only want you to put a fire sign in the comment if you know what it's like to make it off of broken pieces. That the truth of the matter is I've never had everything I needed but the Lord always made a way. They make it off of broken pieces. 200 76 people in the water off of pieces of what they depended on. And I want to submit to you, I'm running out of time. I want to submit to you that the, 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 huh, that the misconception that most people miss is that within every miracle is a miracle that you miss. <laughs> within every miracle is a miracle that you miss. Pastor Mike, what are you talking about? Because the text says when they arrived safely on shore. I'm in Acts chapter 28 now. In Acts chapter 28 verse 1 it says, And after we had been brought safely through, we discovered that the island was called Malta. Now Acts chapter 28 verse 1 is enough to shout because it says after we had been brought safely through. There is no wasted ink in the Bible. So why would they say safely through unless there was danger in the water? 
okay? So, because I told you within every miracle is a miracle you miss, okay? I'm going to read three scriptures. I'm going to quote three scriptures. I want to see if you catch the miracle. Acts chapter 28, verse 1. And after we have been brought safely through, we discovered that the island was called Malta. The natives, because of the rain and the cold that had set in, kindled the sticks and began to build us a fire. They showed us extraordinary kindness. But then verse 3 says, and Paul gathered an armful of sticks. You missed it. You missed it. Pastor Mike, what's the miracle? Did you not remember that I told you when Paul got on the boat, he was in chains? He's a prisoner. But when we see him after the storm, he's walking around building a fire. It's because you thought God broke the boat. But sometimes God breaks the boat to break your chains. Sometimes God breaks the boat to break your chains. Make that make sense. Modernize, contemporize, and McClurize. Please may bring that from antiquity to modernity. Make it make sense, Pastor Mike. What if God broke the relationship to free you? Because sometimes God breaks that to free this. And Paul is now walking around, but I told you, within every miracle is a miracle you miss. Because I told you 276 people are making it to shore off of broken pieces of the boat. They are now in the water holding on to a piece of the boat. You've seen Titanic. You've seen Jack. 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 I'm sorry, Rose, but that boy was big enough for both of us to get on it. No, that ain't relationship goals right there. You on the boat calling my name. Scoop over let me on the board girl so they in the water holding on to pieces of wood what's the miracle pastor mike in the book of genesis god said let there be light and he and it, it was there then he said i'm gonna separate flying things from crawling things and swimming things in the book of genesis i hollered at my boy noah he told me it's some fish in the water yeah. come on come on which means if god created everything in genesis whatever he created in genesis is still in the water in Acts. Which means when they are in the water, not only are they surviving from being drowned, God put a hedge, a protection around them to not let what was in the water take them out. That's what grandmama meant when she said, I'm keeping you safe from danger seen. And, and, and text says, look at me. The text says, Paul is walking around. And the scripture says, the natives begin to build him a fire. And I like that because nowhere in the text of the text tell me who's the leader. That's why I love transformation so much. I've been here, and, and, and although I know Pastor Mike is the leader, I can't tell who's in charge because everybody's a loving person. They're hugging me. They're, they're telling me. I walked in, and everybody started clapping, and, and I'm hugging people, and this person fist pumping me. And I said, you know what? This is why they're growing. Because when you see folk, because keep in mind, Paul came out the water. He's wet. He's damp. He got seaweed on him. He stinks. He smells. But they love him. He don't look like them. He don't smell like them. He don't talk their language because he's a native. But they don't look at him and say, now go take a shower and come back. They don't look at him and say, now go get you some church clothes. They say, brother, come to us. Just because it's not about clothes, it's about souls. And I got to go because I'm running out of time. Paul sees them building a the fire. And fire is a euphemism or metaphor for praise. Whenever you see elements, understand that elements have spiritual connotation. Water is synonymous with the Holy Spirit of baptism. Wind, ruah, breath of God. Fire is praise. No, it's not, Pastor Mike. That's why the prophet said, when I tried to keep it to myself, I'm not going to preach no more. I'm not going to shout no more. I'm not going to preach no more. Mm. Fire. But it's mm. fire, just like mm. fire. fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown in fire, not for stealing, but refusing to praise what they said praised. Because within every miracle is a miracle. Pastor Mike, within every miracle is a miracle. Yeah. And what happens is Paul says, no, y'all ain't going to build a fire for me. Or in other words, I'm not going to let nobody beat me praising God. Because you think you know? I really know. I need seven people who be like, no, truth of the matter is, I really know what God did for me. If it had 
not being for the Lord who was on my side. Bruh, God been good to me. He been good. From living in an extended state using road quarters to make sure me and my girl was good, not because I didn't have a good father and a good mother. I was just bullhead and I was determined to do it on my own. And so I'm out here struggling when I didn't even have to. And that right there is a message. Why PMJ? Because there are two connotations of people. Either you're lost or you're hiding. They're not the same. See here at Transformation, we seek to save that which is lost, not those that are hiding. See, lost is uh, ignorance. Hiding is intentional. To be lost, when you're lost, you're lost. Turn by the, by the store. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what store. I, I'm, I'm, I'm lost. When you're hiding, you did it on purpose. I was hiding. I know what that's like. I know what it's like to feel like the black sheep of your family. To have a brother who I love with all my heart who's sitting right there. Number one football player in the state of Alabama. Man. Go on to Florida State and get degrees. And I'm sitting there like, man, I'm his number one supporter. But I dropped out of college. My sister who graduated her degree, and it's like, they would come to the school and say, how's Darius doing? Yeah, how's Leek? We praying for Mike. I know what it's like to be lost. I know what it's like to be anointed, but lost. Gifted, but twisted. I could sing on Sunday mornings, but the anointing hasn't, it just didn't register yet. And so many of you are lost. And so many of you are hiding. You're hiding. Hiding. He didn't leave the 99 to go get the one because he was hiding. He went and got the one because the one was lost. Conversely, the father didn't go get the prodigal son because he was hiding. And Paul says, I'm not going to let anybody beat me praising. And Paul picks up a bundle of sticks, right? All of that was my, all of that, all of, all, all of that was my introduction. This is my sermon, okay? This is my sermon. Because he picks up, he, he picks up, he picks up a bundle of sticks, right? Picks up the sticks and he says, boom, I'm going to build my own fire. And the text says, as he was laying them on the fire, ah, a snake, ah, jumps out of the sticks. All of that was my introduction. For the next four minutes, I want to give you my sermon topic. My sermon topic is scam likely. Scam likely. Uh, your, your, your phone carrier is doing something right now to prevent calls that don't serve your purpose. They're labeling those calls for you scam likely. Because they realize who's ever calling you does not want to help you. They want something from you. This is a scam this is a scam and what do we see by definition a scam is to gain by deception it's when somebody gets ahead in life by tricking another person and taking what they have you saw this in the old testament when they tried to trick the father and say i'm gonna steal the birthright you saw this when the mother was trifling and she did her best because the, bro- the father's sight was wrong. She switched her sons and had no idea God was going to say. Because what God has for you. The word that the Bible uses to describe scam is deceive. And the devil is also called the deceiver. So scam likely, I'm sorry. The devil, if I had to succinctly summarize it, the devil is a scammer. And his mission is to steal your identity, drain your mentality, manipulate you financially. And here's what he does when we see this text. In the sticks is a snake. Did you know when snakes enter environments that were antithetical to who they are, they were restricted. So the snake, because it's in an uncomfortable place, is fronting or scamming like a stick. I'm done. Live long enough. You're going to deal with two types of people. Sticks and snakes. Live long enough. You're going to deal with sticks and snakes. Pastor Mike Jr., how do I know the difference between both of them? Put them in the fire. 
put them in the fire. No, you find out if they're a stick, if you can tell them no, but they love you. You find out if they're a stick, that when you go down, they come down with you. See, how do I know you're a stick? Thank you, because mom and dad believe in prayer. You are a stick when you can practice the art of intercession without an invitation and without some information. You can practice the art of intercession without information or invitation. Make that make sense. You can pray for me without me having to ask you to pray for me and without having information in order to pray for me. That's when I know you a stick. See, when I tore my ACL up playing ball, my pastor, I'm sorry, my doctor gave me some sticks. I'm sorry, some crutches. Because I couldn't get along by myself. So he gave me sticks. I'm sorry, crutches. He said, since you don't have the strength to transition, I'm going to place you with a stick. I'm sorry. Something that help you make it. But you are a snake when you can't handle what God is doing in my life. But what if I told you before I open the doors and somebody gets saved and I want to prophesy that over 500 people are going to give their life to Christ today. As I'm preaching, as I'm praying, somebody has given their life back to Christ. This summer you have lost your way. During the pandemic you have lost your way. Somebody has logged on by, by happenstance and said, man, he's preaching to me. You're going to give your life to Christ today. I want to submit to you that the devil isn't even the best scammer. The Bible says the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? So I would like to submit to you that your heart is the biggest scammer that you know. Because when your heart broke, your head don't work. When your heart's broke, your head don't work. And Paul is bitten by a scam. He's holding a snake while well, a snake is holding him when he thought it was a stick. With all the anointing Paul has, he still gets bit. All the favor on his life, he still get bit. He preaching, opening churches around the world, still get bit. Writing books that are still on the bestsellers list, still getting bit. And I want to free you, getting saved will not prevent you from being bitten. Bites come with it. And can't you see Paul with a snake on his hand? And here's what I want to leave you with. Because I know you've been bitten. I know you've been bitten. I've been bitten. Loved people and did the most for them. And now they won't even answer my calls. Help people. I've wanted more for people than they wanted for themselves. I've been bitten. Y'all know you've been bitten. Trusted people and loved people. And sometimes you deserve to get bit because you were wrong. Life happens. But here's what I love so much about Paul, because there's no waste of ink in the Bible. Nowhere in the text does Paul emote. Nowhere in the scripture does Paul say, ouch. I know emotions are relevant because the Bible says when Jesus is on the cross, he screamed, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. He emoted. And one text says, Jesus wept. So I know emotion is present in the Bible. That means that they left it out. It was intentional. Paul gets bit, but silent. I want to submit that some of you are doing more damage than the bite. Because when bit people start speaking, they don't lead, they bleed. And some of us have yet to develop into who we are. And there are even people maybe in this ministry and other places who have shifted because you did not properly handle the bite. You are no longer a leader because the leader can move while bitten. You are now a bleeder. A leader who's been bit, who's now bleeding on people. And Paul gets bit. I hit my toe before and said, ah. I got a paper cut before and said, I fall and said, ah. Paul says, nothing. I know Paul has emotion because the Bible says, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and screamed. He screamed so loud that he timed his scream with the earthquake that the door opened. And one person said, Pastor Mike, it's impossible for a door not to, for a door to open if you don't have a key. I said, it is not impossible. They said, Pastor Mike, if you don't have a key, the door can't open. What if I told you, what if I told you, what if I told you, Rod, can you stop playing? Can you stop? What if I told you Paul had a key? Oh, Rod, what key is that? Oh, oh, 
oh, Rod, what key is that? Oh, oh, he found the key. Rod, stop. Hold on, Rod. What key is that? That's a key. See, noise musically is called keys. So your pray is, praise is not just noise. Your praise is a key. And I want to prophesy that if we begin to shout from transformation, Rod, there will be some doors opening in your home because you are about to use your key. Somebody shout until you find the key that's unlocking the door that God is about to open in your life. Oh! Unlock a health door. Oh! Unlock a financial door. Oh! Unlock a spiritual door. Paul says, I'm bidden, but I'm not going to say nothing. And the very people who saw him bitten say it, a murderer, no doubt. Yeah. Although he escaped the sea, yeah. justice won't let him live. Yeah. Look at me. Everybody's not going to be happy when you survive. And for many people in your life, you got to tell them either love me or leave me alone. Yeah. Don't celebrate me in verse 1 and 2. Then hate on me in verse 4 and 5. Make up your mind. Oh my God, make up your mind. Either you're with us or just make up your mind. And the Bible says after they watched him for a long time, waiting on him to swell up and die, Paul shook. Shook it off. Paul he shakes it off Paul finds a new way to praise because you're, it, it's called it's called Michael, 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 Michael Michael, 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 Michael it's called a prophetic gesture that this is when William Murphy said he's leaning in my that, that that's called I need somebody in your home and in the studio to just lean it, it's called a prophetic gesture it means God is shifting things but, but watch this, watch this Paul says, I'm not going to praise with my lips or prophesy with my mouth. I'm going to let my actions speak. I need a hundred people to just shake in your living room. For the next 90 seconds, I want you to pull your cell phone out and record yourself shaking. I want you to grab your purse and shake your purse until your finances get stronger. Shake yourself until you get out of the bad mood you're in. Shake yourself until your mind realizes that God has not brought me this far to leave me right now. I feel a shaking that is happening and God is getting ready to free you. He shakes it off because Paul is resilient. And last thing, resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, toughness. I want to speak over your life because of the different scams you've been exposed to. God has given you a unique anointing, watch this, to not just recover, but to recover quickly. What should have took two years by faith is going to take two months. Pastor Mike, you can't speak that. You're looking at it. I put my first song out in 2019. In 2019, I released my first song. By 2019, September, the album is number one. By 2020, the song is number one. By 2021, the next song is number one. A couple weeks ago, I won all of these Stella Awards. And people keep asking me, they keep asking me, they keep saying, how does it feel? How does it feel? And they think I'm fake when I say, I don't know. Because I, I believe they're expecting me to be excited because I am excited or, or to just be blown away. But if faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence, you, you can't sing big then be shocked by it. No, no. I am grateful 
But God made my mama promise. He made my mama promise when I was suicidal and on the freeway closing my eyes, driving and totaled my father's car. And a lady by the name of Melva Jackson stopped me. One of the church mothers pulled me to the side and said, boy, you couldn't kill yourself if you wanted to. And I looked at her mad and she said, look at me. She said, God showed me you in an arena. And people were banging on the door trying to get in. She said, now look behind the curtain and you were behind the curtain. And I yelled, stop playing. And when they opened the curtain, it was you. You said, Jesus. And all of these young people got saved. At the age of 27 years old, we rented a 5,000-seat arena in our city. At that time, I didn't have that many members to fill an arena. And when I got to the building, you couldn't even get in. And out of all those people there, to the left of me, I saw Ms. Melva say, And I fell down and started crying. When our family didn't have nothing, and all the preachers would get out of their Cadillacs and had all their stuff, and my dad had to drive the church van. But he had excellence. He would get out of the church van and put a stoop down and open the door for my mother and help her down and pick all of his kids up. He made sure our clip-on ties were nice. He would pray over us every night. And I never forget he looked at me and said, Mike, you're different. He said, if you ever realize who you are, God's going to use you. I can look at you in, in your eyes and boldly tell you God has the ability to help you recover quickly. Do me a favor. I want to be very clear right here. I want to make, make this very clear. If you don't know Jesus or if you know Jesus, but Pastor Mike, I'm slipping. The world is opening again and I done ran back to stuff I was over. See, I want to free you real quickly. See, many of you keep going in cycles because you can be delivered from a demon. You cannot be delivered from you. See, we can pray a spirit off you. It's hard to pray you off you. So the problem ain't that a demon got you. You got you. And you're going to say, Pastor Mike, I'm slipping. So I want to be very clear because I'm, I'm, I'm done. If you don't know Jesus, or maybe, Pastor Mike, I know Jesus, but I've been slipping, man. I'm a good person, had a bad week, a bad three months. I've I just been slipping. My prayer life ain't been where it is. I want to do something. There's a number right there at the bottom of your screen. Can you do me a favor? Try Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Right now, all you have to do, right, 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 right where you are. If you just text SAVED to 828282, it's real simple. Eight being the number of new beginnings. Three eights, the number three being the signature of God. Two being the number of witness. Eight, new beginning, three signature of God. Two, number of witness and agreement, which means your new beginning has been signed off by God and the world will bear witness to what you do today. <laughs> Hear me, try Jesus try Jesus and right now in the comments I want I want to I want to see because sometimes you need motivation if you're unashamed to say I'm trying Jesus or I'm rededicating my life to Jesus real simple put me in the comment right now put me oh my God put do you see that oh, oh my can, can we praise God do you see that look from around the world do you see that I see it prophetically in the spirit. Do you see that? What are you waiting on? I know we don't preach like this no more, but they taught me growing up, no man knows the day nor the hour. You cannot wake up in the morning. You can leave to go for Chick-fil-A and your car is hit by a bus. You can take a nap and not wake up. Where will you wake up? When you get to the gate, they're not going to care about your drip. They're not going to care about how much money you got in the bank or who your mother was. They're not going to care because you sung praise and worship or transformation. Pastor Mike, how can I rededicate my life? I just did worship easy, just like you need to. Your man of God and your leaders will respect you more if you're, trans you're transparent enough to say, hey, help me. Because it is possible to be leading while being bit. Get out and live a transformed life. And if you do that, the best is yet to come. Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak over their life. Old things are passed away. 
and behold all things are made new so for the next 30 seconds 60 seconds just find your place of peace find your place of peace come on I see you right there find your place of peace text it right there yes God I'm coming out better I'm coming out strong shut up I'm coming out wise I'm coming out better go out and live a transformed life go out and live a transformed life you're coming out stronger you're coming out wiser you're coming out better right hey you're coming out better oh go out and live a transformed life somebody's getting excited go out and live yes that's God a transformed life I feel God you're coming out better you're coming out stronger you're coming out wiser you're coming out better it's already done God I thank you for Pastor Mike Todd I thank you for his life I thank you for the inspiration he is not just to his ministry but to those of us who labor with him I thank you God for him trusting me enough to allow me to speak to his people now God I pray that everything he needs is already done every word that was spoken over his life by his parents in her womb is manifesting right now god i lift up natalie bless her cover she is proverbs 31 she is walking favor god i speak by faith that the seeing gift that is on her life is being uh, expedited that the gift and the ability to see those things and discern those things you're doing even now cover all his babies cover all his babies god do for little mike what you did for my mike God, you took him from being shy and on the spectrum of autism and so much to now he's bold and he no longer goes to a separate class. He's in a regular class and he's smart. And even before I preach, he, he texts me the entire bio of Loki. And I'm like, I'm loving seeing him become who he is because God, as a father, sometimes it's hard when you can deliver everybody but yours. So God, I lift up little Mike and all those beautiful girls and those queens that are in his life cover transformation cover the executive team cover the staff cover the worship department bless this album that is on the way to change the world I speak by faith that we will never be the same we will go out and live a transformed life it's in Jesus name God bless you transformation God bless you transformation I love you and until next time, I'm Pastor Mike Jr. God bless you.